me stiff necked. I'm not going to say the rest of that, but anyway, I'm stiff necked and I, I, I've had the longest crick, I guess. I'm, I pray to God that's what I got, a crick. But I've tried ice and heat and hot water and I mean, everything that I know, I can't, I can't move it much. I was doing pretty good. I come up the hill and yelled, hit a hole or something. And when she did, my neck did like, it's, it went, when you, you know, when you, like, like if you've got a muscle and you just tense that mu something like that, that, that this little extra, whatever that is, just sets it off. So if I, if I holler, don't think nothing about it. Just think I'm praising God, okay? <laughs> because usually when a nerve pain hits me, it doesn't make any difference where I'm at, Brother Scott. I'm going to holler. I, I yelp like a dog hit with a brick. I just say, hit. And so that's just the way it is. And, and then there's this thing about preaching and... Um, you know, people questioned me, especially those immediate in my family, and asked me, why do I take them? Well, I don't know how not to. I have not learned how to do that yet. There's something about preaching when God calls you to preach that you want to preach. You have a desire to preach. And the problem is, if you do not have a desire to preach, I would say maybe God had not called you to preach. And so God does give you a desire to preach. He gives you a message to preach. And it's just hard for me to say no when I, I love to do it. I never will forget the very first time I went to Alabama to preach for Dr. W.H. Quisenberry in Coleman, Alabama, Victory Baptist Church. And when I, I had a nine, what was it, Gail? About a 72 Mercury Monterey uh, Mercury car. And it used a whole lot of gas. And it used usually more oil than it did gas. And we had to keep cases of oil in there, and we put it in there. And I went to Alabama, and I preached for him all day on Sunday, and it was a good ways. Uh, we're two hours from Atlanta. How far is Coleman from Atlanta? Two more hours or more? Something like that. So four or five hour drive, and we got there, and I didn't realize uh, Brother Quisenberry had to do truck farming to make it, and pastor a church. I just thought, you know, he had it out. He had it made. <laughs> but we got there, and uh, their house had burned to the ground. And Mrs. Quisenberry come and brought me the the Bible, their Bible. And showed me there was a, a, a envelope with a check in it, and um, she said, "Brother Brown, we lost everything that we had. Everything was burnt up. Everything. There's two things that remained." And she said, "It was our Bible. Our Bible didn't burn, and our tithe didn't burn." Our tithe and our check was right here in the Bible, and it was protected. That was the only things that we did not lose. And Brother Quisenberry, and I didn't realize this till later, but Coleman is pretty big on growing sweet potatoes. And uh, he was truck farming sweet potatoes, and so I'm almost positive that the church didn't give me anything I think that Brother the Quisenberries did, gave me a $20 bill. And uh, so I, I got that $20 bill and a trunk load of sweet potatoes. I was able to give sweet potatoes to everybody in our church at Victory Baptist in Washington, Georgia. But I said all of that to say this, I still felt like Jesse James. I said, oh my goodness, how in the world you get to come and do something like this and you love it so much and you, 
enjoy it so much, and then they're going to give you something for doing it that you enjoy doing so much. And that's just the way I feel about it. God is always taking care of me. There have been times that I had to, I had to pay my way to get back home. And uh, I didn't fuss about it, and, and if they call me, I'll go back again. Amen. Why? Because it's just something special about getting to preach. You don't have to preach. Thank God you get to preach. And so to me, it's a privilege, and thank you, preacher, for uh, letting me. Do you know what? I don't sit right here and forgot to put this on. I'm holding it in my hand. Brother Bill, I'm sorry. I'll get to it. You got it on anyway, ain't you? Yeah, all right. Nehemiah, let me do, let you be turning. Uh, I had started this uh, before vacation Bible school. We veered off during vacation Bible school and did something else. And I had two more little bitty points for this message. I did one of those. It's been so long, I probably don't remember it, and you probably don't either. But I'll just mention that just a, a moment or two by way of introduction. Does anybody remember what I was preaching out of Nehemiah chapter number 6? That really impressed me, if you do remember that. Nehemiah chapter number 6, what was I preaching here out of these thir uh, uh, 14 verses that I started uh, uh, maybe a month or so ago. I don't know. Do you remember? Anybody? Raise your hand. All right, Mom, I know you probably got it wrote down, but go ahead and say it. No, I'm asking for the title, oh. not the points. The Who said that? The aim of purpose. Okay, the aim of the adversary or the purpose of the adversary. Let me ask you this. How many of you believe that you and I have an adversary? Would you raise your hand if you believe that? Do you know that there are people that do not believe that? But we do have an adversary. And then there are people that believe that we have an adversary, but they would not admit that our adversary is the devil. He's the old serpent. He's the dragon. He's the beast. He's the false prophet. He is Satan himself. Nehemiah chapter number 6, on the aim of the adversary, there are three things. I'm sure Miss Debbie wrote that down. I saw her doing it. And she's got it written down now. There are three points in these 14 verses. I'm certain that there are more than three points, but these are the three main points that I have written down in this portion of Scripture. Number one is the adversary, his purpose, his aim is to attack your mind. Now, I need to ask you this before I begin tonight. Do you ever have him attack your mind? If you've had your mind attack, I mean really the attack of Satan on your mind, would you raise your hand if you know what it is for him to get into yourself and into your mind and attack your mind? Now, that's what he tries to First of all, we see it here in this portion of Scripture. Now, he has more than one tactic. He has more than one play in his playbook. And if he cannot get you through your mind and discourage you in your mind, what does he do next? Somebody tell me that wrote it down. He will accuse you of your motive. What are you doing this? You are doing this not for the Lord God, but you are doing this for your own self. 
And of course, if I get glory or if you get glory uh, for ourselves, then God doesn't get the glory, then we really don't get it. And so there have been, I would say this, there have probably been prayers of mine that could not have reached over my head. And I would venture to say there have been times when you have prayed to the Lord God about your own motive instead of being for God's glory and His motive that that prayer may have not gotten over your head. Amen? There are times in churches that people do this, praise God, and get no credit for it from God whatsoever. Now, I don't know when it is or who it is, but God does. Because God knows why they're doing that. Are they doing this for the glory of God? The only thing you'll ever get, get credit for and go on your record is what you do for the glory of God, not what you do for yourself. So the second thing, if He does not attack your mind and if He does not accuse you of your motive be, being self seeking and for yourself, what is the third thing we mentioned that He will do? He will alter your mission. Could I ask you a question? And just off the top of your head, what is the mission of Revival Baptist Church? Somebody tell me the mission. What is the mission of Bible Baptist Church? Spread the gospel. Yes, that's the number one mission. We are put here so men and women and boys and girls can get saved, but that's not the only reason. We are put here so that we can come and learn and grow in the grace of God. We're put here to spread the gospel. We're put here to baptize those that get saved. We are here so that people can get called to preach and go out. We can reproduce ourselves. We're put here for that reason. And to baptize the believers. And to do what? Send missionaries around the world to do what we cannot do. So, Nehemiah chapter number 6, verse number 1. Let's read a little bit tonight. And I'm going to go real fastly through the first points that I made and try to get into the second and the third point. But it's pretty lengthy in reading. But I feel like we do need to read this tonight. Now, it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian, and the rest of our enemies. Please, please uh, circle that, underline that, and notice what they did. All they had to do was hear. They heard that I had built the wall. Notice, and let's use the enemy like Satan, Satan had learned that he had what? Made some progress. You see that? That I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in. He puts in parentheses here. Though at that time I had not set up the doors uh, upon uh, the gates that Samballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But we know that he said, Ono to Ono. He said, It is not the will of God for me to go. But they, now why? Because he knew what they were there for. He knew what their aim was. He knew what the aim of Satan was. They 
th they thought to do me, say it with me, mischief. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work. Now wait a minute. God has called me to do one thing. God has called your pastor, my pastor, to do one thing. God has called others to do other things. If God has called you to do something, and He selected you to teach Sunday school, whatever He's called you to do, that is important. That the, the important thing in your life is the will of God. God does not listen. If I am not me, who is going to be me? If you are not you, who is going to be you? God didn't call you to be somebody else. God didn't call you to be something else. God called you to be you. And God called you to be the person that He has selected you to do. I'm doing a great work. Now notice how He answered that. So that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease? Now notice what He's saying here. He is simply saying, if I'm not here doing this work, who's going to do my work? And so it's important that you do the work that God has called you to do and nobody comes and does your work for you. He said, whilst, whilst I, I'm glad they use that word whilst, amen, because I've used that word most of my life and I found it in the Bible, that helped me out. <laughs> amen, whilst I leave it and come down to you. If I quit, if I come down to you, then who's going to do my work? Yet they sent unto me four times after this same sort. Now I have to say, I, I never am going to get th through reading if I keep commenting all the way through the Scripture. But anyway, he said, they kept doing this time. He said, four times after this sort. Now listen, let me ask you something. Hey, I ask it the first. Has the devil ever attacked you in your mind? Huh? And, and you told him to get behind you, didn't you? And he did it, didn't he? And he never attacked you anymore, did he? No, he's going to do it and do it and do it. He is a relentless foe. And just because you tell him to get behind, ain't nothing wrong with telling him to get behind me, Satan, but don't mean he's going to do it, amen? You just have to, might have to keep telling him. But he's going to do it over and over again. Notice he said this, Brother Tom, he said, After the same manner. Then sent Sanballat his servant unto me in like manner, just like they've been doing. The fifth time, see that? With an open letter in his hand. Please do not forget about this open letter that was in his hand. Wherein was written, here's what was written, it is reported among the heathen, and Gashma said it that thou and the Jews think to rebel. We know what you're doing. You are rebelling against us, for which cause thou buildest the wall that thou mayest be their king. You want to be their king. You want to be their glory. You're trying to do it. See, here's their motive. According to these words, and thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of the... Notice, not of God. Look what you're doing. You have appointed prophets to preach about you. Huh? And uh, that's what he's being accused of. Uh, let me find my place. I took my saying. There is a king in Judah, and now shall it be reported to the king according to these words. Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. Then I sent unto him, saying, There are no such things. Now he rebuked what was said about him. There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou fayest them 
out of thine own heart. You're getting them out of your own heart. For they all made us afraid, saying their hand shall be weakened from the work that it, that it be not done. Now therefore, O God, notice he's talking to God, strengthen my hands. I cannot do this without you. The Bible says, and you may as well know it, and you're supposed to know it already, that I can do nothing without Him. I can't squeeze out my next breath unless God gives it to me. He said, Afterward I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Delilah, the son of Mehetabel, uh, who was shut up. And he said, Let us meet together in the house of God. Now doesn't that sound like a good idea? Within the temple and let us shut the doors of the temple. That all sounds good. For they will come to what? Slay thee. They were looking to kill thee. Yea, when are they going to do it? In the night will they come to slay thee. All are set up. Who's this sound like? Satan, right? And I said, should such a man as I flee, should I run from this? And who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life? Notice what he said. I will not go in. And lo, I perceive that God, notice, that God had not said everything that's flying out there is not of God. Everything, listen to me, everything that claims to be a church is not of God. Everything that has a steeple on it is not of God. They'll suck you in. But he pronounced this prophecy against me for Tobiah and Sambalat. Look who hired him. Had hired him. Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and do so and what? And sin that, uh, and that they might have matter for an evil report that, I might, th that they may reproach me. Now verse 14. My God, Think thou upon Tobiah and Sambalit. Notice I prayed according to these their works. I'm going to let you do it, God. Would you please do it? And on the prophetess Nodiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. The aim of uh, the adversary. I mentioned this, I already mentioned it, the aim of the adversary is to attack your mind, that is his purpose. The awareness of the, air, of the adversary is recorded in verse number one. I'm just going to hit these, I don't have time to go any further. Verse number two, the approach of the adversary is recorded in verse number two, to come let us meet together. We see that Nehemiah received an invitation. Let us meet together. He's, the invitation is somewhat uh, making the idea that they have something compatible, that they have something in common, and yet they do not have one thing in com common. The invitation was to attend the summit conference for them to be together. We've already mentioned that. What was no Nehemiah's reaction to the invitation? Nehemiah realized the intent of uh, the enemy in verse number two. Notice he said it, he claimed it, he mentioned it out loud, but they thought to do me mischief you got to be in mind. you got to be in tune with God so you'll know 
uh, what invitation to take, what invitation not to take. And so he was to, he, he wants to convince us that he has our best interest at his heart when he does not. He is there to attack our mind. Thirdly, Nehemiah responded with insight according to verse number three to the enemy. He realized the integrity of his service. He could not stop what he was doing. What he was doing was important because it is what God had called him to do. I didn't even mention this, but mo I guess all of you know what Nehemiah's job was, don't you? Who was Nehemiah? He was the cupbearer. What did that mean? What did it mean to be the cupbearer? <laughs> it meant that he had to go around with the king and the queen and when they got them a glass to drink, he had to taste it to see if somebody hadn't already poisoned it. Amen? And uh, if he dropped dead, then they know not to drink it. Right? Because he was in, in this captivity. Now, Nehemiah responded with insight to the enemy. He realized the integrity of his service. He said, I am doing a great work. He had to get permission to do all of this, which he did. And so this statement was in reference to the importance of the work that God has called you to do. And then in verse number 3, we see here, notice he said, why should the work cease while I leave it? He realized the influence of his service. Nehemiah knew that if he quit, I mentioned this and you'll remember this, that others will follow the example and quit with you. I had this happen to me. I could not learn. I was a pastor. I felt like when I pastored, uh, in 1986, back in there somewhere, I felt like that God had called me to that place, and I was there, and I had one man that I inherited as a deacon when I got there. He was already a deacon. His dad was a deacon. I'd take 45 of his dads any day. And uh, the young man was also father and son team, a deacon. I won't get into everything about that, but he left me and left me and left me. He left me four different times. And every time he left, he ran his mouth and took other members with him to other places. And that happened, and that happened, and that happened, and that happened. Now, wait a minute. Why did you say, Brother Brown, why did he come back? Because I went and got him. I went every time, all four times. You asked my little wife that back there. I went and got him, and his mama got sick, and she was dying with cancer. I knew he was dying to come to church to see about his mama. And so I just go, I mean, I just go and get him. I, listen, this is my idea. It may not be your idea. If they ain't here, I can't help them. And I felt like that I could help anybody. And I felt like I was supposed to help everybody. And so I did. I went and got him. And after the fourth time, and after we, th we, we were just losing, 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 and he did me wrong every time I finally smartened up and God said, let him go. What have I got to do to you to get your attention? You don't need somebody like that. They'll empty out your church. You say, well, I ain't never experienced nothing like that. Well, I have. Okay. And so I'm just telling you, and this is what I said when people would come visit our church. I'm not trying to be smart. I'm just, I'm trying to be what God would say about it. But, and I'd say this, we'd have people visit our church and sometimes I'd wonder why they visited. And I had one say at one time about joining the church. I called him and he was going to join the church and I said, well, you don't like the church. Why are you joining? He said, because I can't work from the outside in. 
I need to get in. I said, well, you ain't joining. You say, Brother Brandon, I ain't that. Well, it happened. I'm just telling you the truth. That's what people have. Satan plants people. And they're there to discourage and tear down. And when that starts happening, you just let them move on. Finally, I said, well, you just, I'm just going to let you keep walking. You say, Brother Brown, how do you feel about him today? I love him. He just lost a son of his. He died with a liver transplant and he just lost his son and I'm sorry about that and it breaks my heart and I'd talk to him and I'd get him out of the ditch I'd do more than that I'd help him if I saw him on the side of the road I just don't want to be his pastor anymore amen and so I'm just saying when one quits singing another quits singing and when one quits this and another quits that they just, it just, it just snowball effects. And so Nehemiah resisted the insistence by the enemy in verse number four. And the messengers kept coming persistent as they had, it, why? Because it had been a profitable tool in the hands of the enemy. And when the enemy finds a tool that he can fit in his hand and one that will work, uh, according to Judges chapter 16, 4, uh, uh, 4 through 20, 22, like Samson and Delilah and Joseph and Potiphar's wife, he will just keep on, keep on, keep on as long as it works. So we see the aim of the adversary is to attack our mind. Number two, We'll get this far anyway. The aim of the adversary is to accuse you and me and accuse us according to verse number 5. If you'll find verse number 5 and fi find verse number 6, to accuse you of your motive. And to accuse you of your motive is one of the heaviest artilleries that the devil has in his arsenal. He does that. He will discourage you that way more than anything in the world. When he is unsuccessful in attacking your mind, he will assault your mind. Notice, did he, did he use it on Jesus himself? What did he say to the, to the Lord Jesus Christ? You are a what? A wine bibber. You are an adulteress. That's what he said about the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, what else did he say to Satan? You are blaspheming. You are saying that you are God, but they accused him of being the devil himself. And so I'm telling you, I mean, people, listen, you can get up, sing the prettiest song in the world, and somebody will accuse you of doing it for the wrong reason, and then somebody else won't get a blessing out of it, and they'll tell you and hurt your little feelings, and you don't want to sing no more. No, you sing for the glory of God. You play the piano for the glory of God. You do what you do for the glory of God. Not for me, not for the pastor, not for nobody else. You do it for the glory of God and for Him only. Now, Nehemiah, now he has to deal with the attacks on his person. On his person. I watched this happen one time in Statesboro. I happened to be with uh, Brother Max Alderman, what had happened, but somebody had accused him of something at our church, and they had, they had come, what am I, I'll, just, I'll just tell you what it was. We had a lot of people at our church that worked at Georgia Southern University. That's where they made their living. And so when we bought paint to paint the church with, they bought it through Georgia Southern because they got a good price for it. They offered to do that. They did it, 
and then our church paid for the paint. And somehow or another, something got caught up in there, and they had the GBI to come to Dr. Alderman's house while he was sick with fever. Bad, bad thing to do. He's the easiest, mildest man I've ever met in my life. But if you attack his church, you are, it's like attacking his wife. He would, do, he would do no less to attack his church if you attacked his wife. And they, tried, they were trying to do the talking and coming in and, and making an accusation against his church. That's the worst thing you could have ever done in your life. And he told those GBI, they said, well, 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 wait a minute, we're trying to ask the questions here. He said, I'm asking the questions. You're in my house. Who is my accuser? Where is he at? Where is she at? Bring them here right now and put them in front of me. When you attack my church, you attack my wife. This is just like my wife right here, and I love this church. You're not going to come in here and attack my church without bringing your accuser and standing them before me. Anyway, buddy, that thing got heated. And, of course, we won. Very easy. There was nothing to it, except for the fact that I think somebody did accuse. And I think it was somebody that had gotten upset with the church and went and, and started something and they started but, it, but I'm going to tell you something Brother Max Alderman finished it that day Amen. and it was done and it's just like hey I didn't take a lot Brother Tim you didn't take a lot hey come get on me do anything you want to do but that little lady back down you better leave her alone I might get upset you know what I'm, I'm not just just woofing him, just telling the truth. Everybody feels that way. If you don't feel that way, something's wrong with you. Amen. Amen. And so the aim of the adversary is to accuse you of your mo motive. And when you get into somebody's character, and I could tell a lot of stories about that, Brother Bill, when you start attacking uh, my character or something like that, then you've gone too far. Now notice how he did it. Look at verse number five. I got to, be, I got to, I got to hurry up. Verse number five, notice, and Nehemiah received what? An open letter in chapter number five. Sanballat did not do what? He did not seal the letter so that its contents would, be, uh, would not be private. So the contents of the letter, what he, what he wrote in that, which was a lie anyway, would not be private. He wanted all Jerusalem to hear the accusations that he had made about Nehemiah. So the letter attacked, attacked the person of Nehemiah according to verse number 6. It says, Thou and the Jews think to rebel. You, you are doing this to rebel against us. And then they insinuated that Nehemiah was a man that could not be trusted. That is a terrible accusation. That hurts. I've had that happen. And it hurts and you don't want to attack that purpose. That's what they were doing. Then notice with me, secondly, the letter attacked the purpose of Nehemiah. Notice verse number 6. I'm going through this as fast as I possibly can, for which cause thou buildest the wall. He built the wall for the glory of God. But they were saying, no, you're not. You're building it for your own glory. Now he was being accused of self-seeking, using the tongue. Listen, the tongue is a deadly evil, a deadly enemy. And it can praise God or it can curse men or kill men. And so the tongue of Sambelet to accuse the man of God. Notice with me, uh, secondly, Nehemiah refuted the obvious lie. We're moving quickly. In verse number 8, it was an obvious lie. He said, I have done no such thing. 
he made a simple denial in refuting the lie, and two things happened. He corrected the charge uh, uh, from Sam Ballot in verse number 8, and uh, there are no such things done as thou sayest. So Sam Ballot uh, was labeled a liar, but he committed it to God. Uh, the devil is the liar. He's our enemy. He's the liar, and the truth is not in him. Notice verse number 9, what he did. He committed the case to God. He said, Oh God, strengthen my hands. You see that in verse number 9? So what was he? He was a man of wisdom. He refused to retreat. What, and what was his secret? He, play, he prayed to God for strength. He depended on God for strength and to carry him through the storm. And so you think the enemy is going to lower the flag on you? No, the enemy, when it comes up, he's going to get it hotter. He's going to raise the flag. He's going to keep it up. And then notice with me, and I'll just mention this in close. The aim of the adversary is to alter your mission. Look at verse number 10. Afterward I came into the house of Shimei, uh, the son of Delilah and the son of Mahalabel, who was shut up and, and he said, let us meet together in the house of God in the temple and let us shut the doors of the temple for they will come to slay me. Notice they had a plan, kill him. Yea, in the dead of the night. Why? Only thing they want to do, shut your church down. Shut your Sunday school down. Close your Bible. Close your prayer line. Do anything they can to alter your mission. Get you on the other side of where God wants you to be. But you need to know and be smart enough and wise enough like Nehemiah was to know, wait a minute, I got the book, I got the plan, I got the purpose of God. I'm going with God. Amen. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Miss Heather, would you please come? I mean, he'll give you cancer. He'll get, uh, there's a lot of things that will happen to discourage you, to get you off track. But keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Because God has not failed you. God cannot fail you. God will not fail you because you belong to him. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. If you need to come tonight, would you come?